finish. You don't don't hit the finish. Right. worship. I'm glad that you're here, whether you're at home or whether you're here in the pews. It's good to see you. It's a beautiful day to be here. I just want to remind the folks in the sanctuary that uh, we will be humming during the hymn. Shouting aloud and singing for joy. Let it be known that great is the Lord our God. He calls us to worship Him here and now. In this, His presence. With awe and adoration, we come and bring the best of who we are. Lord, so claim us anew. Grant us your presence. of joy we feel at being one of your beloved. Remind us that we are your family of faith, members of the body of Christ. Claim our hearts today as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
So you promised to create a new heaven and a new earth, free from injustice, oppression, and brokenness. Yet we live so much in our own lives in fear, as through sin and war and death are refined words. Please offer us mercy for doubting your good news. In you, tell others constantly how about your grace and that triumphs, and that life may be made new and whole through Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior of all. Amen. John Newcomer saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. now I'm going to do a junior sermon. So kids, uh, come meet me here in front of the pulpit. Well, good morning. Um, 
This week uh, starts on Sunday and it ends next Saturday. And do you know what next Saturday is? What's, what's coming up next Saturday? That's right, it's Halloween. Have you picked out a costume? Are you going to go trick-or-treating this year? Some people probably aren't, but if you do, you'll probably have a costume. So I want to show you a few costumes that uh, some others have, have tried in the past. Maybe you'd like to go as, that's Yoda. <laughs> and here's, here's a little child who put on a, a tiger outfit. That looks really cute. Uh, this little boy dressed up as a pirate. Arr, he's going to go out and gather some booty. There's a little girl wearing a frozen costume. She dressed as a princess. I could talk about this one for a long time, but I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> this little boy dressed up as Frankenstein. Oh, he's a big monster. He's Frankenstein. What kind of costume are you going to wear? A lot of people put on, like that Frankenstein costume, something that's scary. They might go as a ghost or a witch or a Frankenstein. And when you think about scary things, we all are afraid of something. What are you afraid of? I don't mean that you're chicken. I mean things that just give you the creeps, that give you kind of a fear of when you're, um, when you're alone, or, um, well, let's see some pictures of some things that people are afraid of. Here are a couple things that a lot of people are afraid of. They're afraid of spiders and snakes. They don't want to be anywhere near them. When I was young, and maybe it's the same for you, sometimes I'd be afraid of maybe that there was a monster or something under my bed, and I would stay under my covers and, and not not poke my toes out at all because I wanted to make sure that the monster couldn't get them. Some people are just afraid of the dark in general. Being in a, a dark room or having to go down steps into a dark basement, ooh, that's kind of scary. Here's a fear that a lot of people have. It's the fear of speaking in public, of having to stand up in front of a class or in front of a church like Kathy just did. She got over her fear that uh, most of us have about speaking in public. What kind of things are you afraid of? What kind of things kind of give you the creeps? Well, when that happens, we need to remember that God is with us. And he tells us over and over again, do not be afraid, I'm with you. Uh, Joshua was, was Moses' right-hand man. He was the head of the army as Moses uh, led people out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. And when it was time to go into the Promised Land, Moses wasn't going to go in. He kind of finished his term. And so it was Joshua's turn to go in and take over the, the Holy Land, and he was afraid to do it. And in Joshua 1.9, God says, Be bold and strong. Banish fear and doubt. For I, the Lord your God, am with you wherever you go. So Joshua went in, he put his fears aside, and God tells us over and over again, do not be afraid. One time the disciples were in a boat out on the lake, and Jesus wasn't with them, and they looked out over the water, and they saw a body, a person, walking towards them in the middle of the night, and they were afraid. What is it? Is it a ghost? And Jesus calls out, do not be afraid, it is I. Some people are afraid of, of death. Uh, but when the women went to see Jesus after he had uh, been crucified and, and killed, they went to his grave, and when they went into the tomb, there was an angel there who said, do not be afraid, he is alive again. Uh, some people are afraid of the dark. One time the shepherds were out in their fields at night, and it was very dark, and all of a sudden, all around them, light lit up, and they were afraid. What is it, lightning, or what's going on? And an angel called out, do not be afraid. The Lord your, your God has been born down in Jerusalem and go see him. So we need to remember that God tells us when we're afraid. He says, do not be afraid. I counted and there are 67 times in the Bible that God says those three words. Four words. That God says those four words. Do not be afraid. See, I can count. Well, 
Whenever you're afraid, remember that God says, do not be afraid because God is with you. So we're, we're all a little afraid these days with this virus going around, and, and maybe you won't get to trick or treat, but hopefully you'll get to put on a costume, and you'll remember when you do that God is with you. Do not be afraid. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for reminding us over and over again to not be afraid because you are with us. Be with us through this scary time in our lives and help us to remember that you're with us and we don't have to be afraid. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get this out of the way. Our reading, our reading from Psalms is chapter 90, verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 17. Here in church, Pastor Jeff will read in response to with me, and at home you may join him in reading it out loud. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O oh Lord, how long have you wrecked compassion on your servants? Satisfy in the, us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as, you, as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest in your servants and your glorious power to their children. Together, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Hear the word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay, to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. And he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. It ends our lesson. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Taxes have always been a controversial subject. Taxes are one of the subjects of interest in the upcoming election. And they were certainly at the heart of the question asked of Jesus. The Lord has just finished telling three parables to the crowd, and all three made the religious leaders of the day look bad. So the Pharisees, those were the Jews with the sharpest legalistic minds, go off into a corner with the Herodians, who were a branch of the civil service who owed their allegiance to Rome. The two were natural enemies, but together they hated this Jesus guy more than each other. Since the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they combined to concoct a question that would stump Solomon himself. It was designed to discredit him. They asked him about taxes. 
The question they ask is designed so that no matter how you answer, you've condemned yourself. It's a lose-lose question. They ask whether he thinks it's lawful to pay taxes to the emperor, to Caesar. And if he says no, then they can immediately report him for sedition. And if he says yes, then his Jewish followers, who hate being taxed by a foreign nation, won't like his answer and turn against him. Either way, he condemns himself. I'm sure they were licking their chops as they prepared to ask him. But wouldn't you know, Jesus finds a way of answering their question directly without condemning himself. And even more than that, he raises further questions that people 2,000 years later are still trying to answer. He takes a coin, points to the picture of Caesar on it, and says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are God's. When two ancient enemies had conspired to trap him, Instead, his answer left them amazed, and probably a little impressed that someone could think so quickly on their feet with such insight. But that was who Jesus was, a man who knew who he was and what he was about, and had his life in perspective from a godly point of view. And that combination amazed the people around him. His answer calls for us to decide a little bit more about our own self-understanding, and to try to put our lives a little more into a godly perspective. Because the next step past being amazed at his answer is to answer for ourselves the question he posed, what things are Caesar's and what things are God's? That's what I'd like to talk about just a little bit more this morning, but really only that second part, what things are God's. It's time for us to again think about our church budget at our annual meeting later this morning. And I know that that often comes down to a talk of pledges and money. But there's one difference between our talk about money here in the church as opposed to talking about taxes outside the church. Taxes out there are the law. But in here, it's a matter of choice. Out there, they require payment, but in here, it's about offering a grateful response to God's blessings and being thankful for God's life-giving actions. When we talk about money in here, it's never a thought on my part or any of the leaders that it's something we have to do. I want to state that up front. We're talking about voluntary, cheerful giving. Responding to God's love financially through the church is important enough to talk about openly and straightforwardly because as time goes on, I see how more and more it's important for me to do it, and, for, and to hear from others who say how important it is to them. When you look in the Bible, you trip over the number of times Jesus talks about stewardship of finances. And Paul and Peter and Matthew do as well. Jesus asks us to give to God the things that are God, and we deeply need to consider how that can affect our life for good. That means when we check to see where our treasure is, as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when we check to see where that treasure is, then we get to see what we've invested our hearts in. There's a story of a pastor who got up one Sunday morning and announced to his congregation, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we have the, enough money to pay off all our debts and even enough to expand our staff and our programs. We have enough money. Bad news is, it's still in your pockets. <laughs> but you know, when you think about it, God doesn't need one cent from us. Why? Because the earth and everything in it was created by God and already belongs to him. It isn't that God needs us to give to him. He's what you might call a self-sufficient God. The truth of the matter is that God created us with a need to give. Many times in this congregation I've spoken with someone who's suffered the loss of a loved one or have been sick in the hospital, and frequently they are strong about it. And when others offer help, a meal, uh, an offer for a ride, uh, that they would come and visit, 
that person turns it down and says, oh, maybe later, I'm okay for now. Sometimes I'll suggest to that strong individual that they should accept some of the offers that come their way. Because they can help the people around them who are offering their aid by accepting it because they need to give and they need to show that they care. It will allow them to participate with that widow or widower in the grieving process or, or help the person who has needed some medical aid. Folks have a need to give and to show their love in some tangible way. And it's the same for us. God has designed each of us to be a giver, the poorest as well as the most affluent. No one is too poor or too rich to have the need to give. I spoke to a man whose mother was getting up there in years and he had taken over uh, her finances. And as he looked through them, he said to her, you know, for the amount of money that you have coming in, you're giving an awful lot to the church. Don't you think it's too much? And she shushed him, told him to mind his own business about that. It had taken her years to get to that point, and it was what she wanted to do, that she had a need to give, and she, was, she felt she was at the right amount despite her income. But that need can be suppressed or stifled or justified in not happening. The need to give can be paused for so long that it withers. The French tell the story of a doctor in a small village who was about to retire. He'd spent his whole life in medicine for that village, on call, day and night. Over his long career, his patients often couldn't pay much, but he cared for them anyway. So when his retirement approached, the townspeople wanted to show their appreciation and gratitude. And they decided that they would meet one day and everybody uh, bring out a pitcher of their best wine and pour it into a giant barrel in the town square. Then they would present the barrel to the doctor as their sign of love. The time arrived and all day long, people of the village came out and poured their wine into the barrel. It was then presented to the doctor with speeches and pomp and ceremony before they all went home. Later that evening, the doctor drew a cup of wine from the barrel as he sat contentedly by the fire, warmed not just by the flames, but also by the villagers' appreciation. And he took a sip, and he was shocked. It tastes like water. He sipped again. It was water. He went to the barrel in disbelief. It wasn't filled at all with wine. Only water was in the barrel. He called up the mayor and asked him, and the mayor called everyone together in the town council, and they met in emergency session. The truth came out. Everyone in the town had had the same thought. My little pitcher of wine won't be missed. I have so little for myself. Others will take care of it. This little bit of water I pour in won't be noticed. And so they found a way to turn wine into water. Now, no one knows if that story really happened or not, but the sentiment is certainly universally true. My worship, my participation in the church's programs, my gifts won't be missed, my attendance in worship, or at the adult study, my help at cleanup day, or the time I could serve on one of the church committees, my helping out isn't really that important. Someone else will take care of it. And that's a sad thought. So when it comes to our financial giving, it's easy to think that although we feel the need to give, we figure our part won't be missed. Especially this year with the pandemic, when jobs are tenuous or elusive, personal finances might be stretched tight. It's a tough year to talk about giving to the church instead of thinking of the church as a charity. Well, in order to kind of get beyond some of those feelings, let's consider harvest giving. Tom Erich, the pastor, explains the difference between charitable and harvest giving. In charitable giving, church members look at available funds after bills are paid, make an assessment of value, comparing the value of giving to the church with the value of giving to other charitable interests, and then give accordingly. 
church ends up competing with dozens of causes and often compares poorly. Harvest giving, by contrast, starts within the basic biblical principle that what we have comes from God and that it is our solemn obligation for the good of our souls to give the first portion of the year's harvest back to God before anything, even housing and food, comes our obligation to God. Simply put, instead of trying to predict next year's harvest, we look back at the previous year's harvest, or salary, or income, and give, it a, give a portion or a percent of that. As the harvest is better or worse, our giving will reflect that. But we'll be giving from our bounty rather than from our leftovers. It's out of a need to give, because we know how blessed we are that even in our worst times, we know we're better off than most people in the world at their best of times. So we can joyfully make a harvest offering back to God. Where our treasure is, there will our hearts be also. Where is our treasure? Does it reflect the amount of gratitude we have for God's amazing grace? How much of our lives do we allow God control of? He invites us to be a part of his church and welcomes us as brothers and sisters. His own priorities were demonstrated when he rose from the grave that we might have life and have it abundantly. But only after first going to the cross to give his life that we might live lives of forgiveness and gratitude. So, to Caesar, or to Trenton, or to D.C., or wherever, let us give our due so that our state and our nation may prosper and lead. But without coercion or regret, let us consider our need to give and to make a difference. And then show our gratitude to our loving God in a tangible and meaningful way. As we consider our 2021 budget for next year, one of the main line items of income is the pledging and giving of our members. So may our harvest giving inspire us to fulfill our need to show gratitude to God. Let us now offer a prayer to God. Let us pray. We thank you for all that we have, for all the loved ones we have, and especially for your loving care. May we offer our thanks and our praises to you, O Lord Almighty, for all your kindness to us in real and significant ways. For we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
gently. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Again, good morning. Uh, apparently, we're not live to anybody out there. We're just recording. Are we still recording, John? Uh, for nine more seconds, according to this. Uh oh, it's about to run out. It well, wants extra storage. The and the junior sermon in. And, it uh, might love to have you here. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to hit a few of the highlights from our announcements. A few things I'd like to remind everyone. The first is there's a congregational meeting. And uh, we hope that you'll stay for it. Just do a quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. We do not have a number of quorum in here. We're going to be using uh, Zoom on the computer over there to bring in a few more folks. That should give us a quorum. And uh, we will have our congregational meeting beginning at 11. So if we finish before 11, Please stick around if you're a member uh, for uh, the meeting that starts then. Tomorrow is the final day to make donations to the college care packages. We have 14 young people in school. We'll be putting their packages together around 11 tomorrow morning. So if you still have something to drop off, please do it by then. Many thanks to everyone who has donated already. Thanksgiving baskets are going to be put together by the deacons next month. So please save up your points to be able to donate a turkey. We'll need about 25 of them. Hi, our recording didn't work during the prayer, so I'm going to offer it now. Let us pray. Almighty God, as the days shorten and the leaves fall from the trees, we turn to you, our unfailing source of light and life. While we wonder what tomorrow will bring, we are certain of your love for us, no matter what challenges we face. We trust your promise to never abandon us and your power to uphold us all our days. We marvel that you choose to be in a relationship with us, forgiving us repeatedly and surrounding us with grace daily. Confident in your never-changing character of mercy and kindness, we turn to you now in prayer, laying bare our hopes and our fears and the longings of our hearts. God of love, there is no corner of creation that does not belong to you and that is not beloved by you. We bring to you now those for whom we know you would want us to pray for, so we remember Colton Ward's family after he was killed by a car while riding his bike at age 11. Bring comfort to his family in their grief, Lord. We bring to you also Boyd Adams and Joe Oliver, Autumn's dog Mac, and Maureen Gallo, who's on a ventilator because of COVID-19. We remember Nancy Dean, Sally and Rich Innes, and Paula Pilla, recovering from heart surgery. Be with Grandma Rowe, Cass, who's been exposed to the COVID virus, Lars and Greg DeVita. Here are prayers for Lars Ludvigsen, for Linda and Muriel Card. Give strength to James Seeger's dad, Joe, fighting COVID in the hospital, as well as all those fighting for their lives. May a vaccine come soon. Be with Debbie Yaniga's family after her passing, and Grandfather Jean Kresge on being admitted to the hospital. Lorraine, Bill, and Rick all fighting cancer. And Mary Jo, who had a heart attack Thursday, and Michelle Walker. As we remember the hurting and vulnerable, whom you hold especially close, give us the courage to tend to them in ways that reflect your compassion and justice. Remind us yet again that when one part of the body hurts, we all suffer. Until that time, we all rejoice together. Loving Lord, we pause to rest in your, com in your comfort 
and in your presence. Knowing that we are approved by you to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, we ask to be bold in our witness and humble in our service for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.